Okay, good evening everyone. This is an impromptu live stream from uh, Restoration Fellowship. Tonight uh, we're going to present a uh, response to something that's come up in our small non-Trinitarian community regarding the reliability and authenticity of certain New Testament books brought up by our friend over at Integrity Sync, what is it, Integrity Syndicate.com. <laughs> and so I've been asked, uh, I've been in conversations with some people and I've been asked to do a little response here. And uh, I have Sir Anthony and he'll join me in a little while, but before then, so the issue is whether we should as Christians put uh, any Bible book above another and whether all, is it all of scripture? In other words, is it all, is, is, are all the books of the Bible supposed to be on equal footing in terms of they're all inspired by God, they, they all contain uh, teachings, material, uh, that Christians should try and adhere to, especially, obviously, this is a conversation on the New Testament, not so much on the Old Testament. And um, <clears throat> so this conversation, obviously, is, is ancient. Uh, it started in the first uh, centuries, first decades, really, of the Christian movement. You can look up uh, names like Marcion, uh, a, a, uh, I believe a leader of a group of uh, Christians who who uh, sought to create their own canon. I think it's one of the earliest canons put together by Marcionites. That's M-A-R-C-I-O-N, by the way, Marcion. And they did things like they, they uh, only gathered certain uh, gospels and left other books out. There was also a debate in the early church about what books should be included in as a as a standard for the Christian community, what became known as the New Testament. Uh, long conversations and discussions among the early churches and the leaders of the churches, those bishops about um, books like the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation, which took uh, longer to be accepted uh, in the community as a whole. But um, today, tonight, uh, it's to, uh, by the way, it's June 21st, 2022. So we will allow for the time that we have available tonight, Anthony and myself, uh, we will have some questions answered. And uh, if you have any questions out there, please type them in all caps. Related to this topic, again, we're talking about what constitutes a New Testament canon. Should one New Testament book be prioritized above another? And is it all scripture? Can we trust what we have as New Testament books from the Gospels to the book of Revelation as authentic, reliable for your Christian living, your Christian teaching every Sunday? if that's when you get together. <clears throat> and I want to start uh, defining the criterion of canonization. In other words, how is it that what we have as a New Testament, how is it that those books were put together? What, what uh, requirements have to be met in order for a book to be a New Testament book? So I'll start with that and we'll go from there. So this is a, the, the conversation from Integrity Syndicate is actually a small part of a broader, bigger conversation about really what constitutes New Testament canon or the books of the New Testament and how reliable and authentic they are for our Christian living, our Christian teaching. So let me start with a sort of a uh, general look of how the canon process works as, as far as I understand it.
First, let's look at a comparison of the New Testament against other ancient historical documents. As you can see from this chart, the earliest manuscripts date from the 100s AD, which is about 50 plus years from when they were originally believed to have been written, composed in the 40s to 90s AD. And that's a time period of 30 to 150 years that 25,000 plus New Testament manuscripts are derived from. When you compare that to other ancient historical documents, you see the huge gap and difference. The second one there, Homer's Iliad, the earliest manuscripts that they found is in the 400s BC. And that's, as you can see, a time elapsed of 400 years after the original supposedly was written. And then you see the number of manuscripts. So as we go down this list, you can see the clear advantage the New Testament writings have, thus proving their authenticity. In the book, The Text of the New Testament by textual critics Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman, we read that besides textual evidence derived from New Testament Greek manuscripts and from early versions, the textual critic has available the numerous scriptural quotations included in the commentaries, sermons, and other treaties written by early church fathers. Indeed, they say, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, in other words, all those manuscripts, they would still be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. One of the authors of this book, Bart Ehrman, wrote another book called The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, looking at the effect of early Christological controversies on the text of the New Testament. So whenever you hear that the New Testament is somehow corrupted, therefore unreliable, claims that come mainly from the Muslim world and so-called atheists or agnostic, this book is a good source to show that, yes, there are known corruptions to the New Testament, but they happen to be so-called orthodox corruptions. And by that, Bart Ehrman means by early Trinitarians or those people who believe Jesus is also God. The same author, though, in his The Reliability of the New Testament, says that although the quantity of textual variants among the New Testament manuscripts numbers in the hundreds of thousands, those that change the meaning pale in comparison. He found that less than 1% of the differences are both meaningful and viable. And whatever differences there are, or so-called corruptions, they happen to be from the affirmation so-called orthodox, or those who believe Jesus is God. We also find this quote in the book, Revisiting the Corruption of the New Testament by Daniel Wallace, another textual critic. He says that the handwritten copies of the New Testament contain a lot of differences. We are not sure exactly what the number is, but the best estimate is somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 variants. The vast bulk of these differences affect virtually nothing. So now let's look at the criterion used for the New Testament canon. In the book, Reinventing Jesus, they focus on three main criterions for the New Testament canon, beginning with apostolicity, was a book written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. Two, whether the book was orthodox in its content, did it conform to the teachings of other books known to be by the apostles, and three, Catholicity, was it accepted early and by a majority of churches? The book goes on to say it is important to note that the age of a work was a determining factor in canonicity. A book that was perceived to have been written after the time of the apostles was categorically rejected. It just so happens that when it comes to the gospel, according to John, they have found the earliest manuscripts or fragments out of all the other Gospels. For example, there's the famous P52 manuscript, still believed by many to be the earliest fragment of the New Testament, dating as early as the 100s AD. So now when we apply the criterion for the Gospel of John, we will find how it fits all of these three Starting with apostolicity, we have these quotes from the early so-called church fathers, 
like Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies, John, the disciple of the Lord, who leaned on his breast, also published the gospel while living at Ephesus in Asia. Then the famous church historian Eusebius, John, who was both a witness and a teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of the Father and being a priest wore the sacral plate. Last of all, John, perceiving that the bodily facts had been made plain in the gospel, being urged by his friends and inspired by the Spirit, composed a spiritual gospel. So by this time in the second century AD, the Gospel of John was accepted as a legitimate, authentic, and reliable source for the life and ministry of Jesus. Then we come to the second criteria, whether the Gospel of John is orthodox in what it says and what it teaches, what it reveals. Well, the story of Jesus' baptism, public ministry, death, and resurrection is the same as the other Gospels. It has some of the same miracles, like the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, as the other Gospels. It has the same debates that Jesus encountered, having to do with the old versus new covenant law debates. Example, breaking the Sabbath in John 5, and things to do with the purification laws, that is, Jesus healing. And of course, the main ministry component of Jesus, the Gospel, which is about the Kingdom of God, as primary throughout. And then the third one, was it accepted by the earliest Christian communities, and a majority of them? Again, in the book Reinventing Jesus, the authors ask, so what did the ancient church recognize as the greater part of the New Testament or the canon within the canon? The four Gospels, Paul's 13 letters, the Acts of the Apostles. Note that that amounts to around 20 to 22 of the known New Testament books or letters out of 27 books, and these were all recognized before the 4th century, when many believed the New Testament canon was finally compiled and closed. Metzger, in his book, The Canon of the New Testament, says that although the fringes of New Testament canon remained unsettled for centuries, a high degree of unanimity concerning the greater part of the New Testament was attained within the first two centuries among the very diverse and scattered congregations, not only throughout the Mediterranean world, but also over an area extending from Britain to Mesopotamia. So I hope that's helpful. Once again, you can see here the, um, Let's see, let me bring up the, so that's the criterion used. Again, I, uh, most uh, scholars, most Christians obviously would agree with this. Um, there's often talk of not following tradition or that we, or some people follow tradition, they're not following God or, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not being guided by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's about tradition. Well, there is good tradition and there's bad tradition just like there are good men and women and there are bad men and women so it all depends uh, you know on on what it's grounded paul in his letters talks about uh, to timothy i believe about the good tradition that was passed on or handed on to him so but i think uh, i this uh, process, these three steps are very sound. They're very logical to me. They make sense. If anyone has taken an ancient history class, by the way, history, ancient history 101, this is how it works. Uh, as I showed you in the chart, I'll bring it back again. This chart is very telling uh, for the authenticity, if not re reliability, of the New Testament writings. Uh, books of antiquity are notoriously difficult to date. They're notoriously difficult to authorship. You know, who wrote it exactly? I mean, these are ancient books, thousands of years. So, <clears throat> all right. So I hope that was helpful. And the truth is that if we start picking apart the New Testament, um, at our own personal uh, calling, let's say, uh, and I'm not doubting anyone's uh, uh, extent of research and, and work that you might put in, but if you have convinced yourself through your studies, years of study perhaps, 
and then you start picking apart the books or saying that this book to me is more valid in terms of Christian living and teaching or his or history than this other book in the New Testament. Once you start doing that, you have to recognize that uh, you have taken away the chessboard. So let's say you're playing a game. Obviously, I'm not comparing our faith with the game, but I'm trying to <laughs> make an analogy here. But if you're playing a game, a board game, and you start doing that to the board, you, you just understand you're getting rid of the board. You have to have some kind of grounding and basis. And again, I'm not saying <clears throat> don't do your work and don't try to uh, look into these things. If you have any questions, you know, we live in an age that one click can get you an answer. So just look it up. Uh, we all do this stuff uh, for a living. Uh, some of us are blessed to do it for a living, I should say. Uh, most of us don't do this for a living, and we have to rely on others to guide us. And we do this in many areas in life, by the way, like your health. <laughs> you know, if you start feeling sick or something, you you go to a professional, someone who's devoted their life to health. And uh, if your car is is not running well, you go to a mechanic. <clears throat> so we understand that we don't always have the opportunity to do what we love to do and are good at doing. But those that do, I think, should be recognized and should be listened to. And all these quotes, by the way, that I'm using, yes, they are Trinitarian scholars. Uh, Bruce Metzger is uh, probably one of, of the most famous so-called textual critics. But again, you have to uh, test what they're writing, what they're saying. It's just because they're Trinitarians and we're not, you're just going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Uh, I think that is a biblical standard to take the good and throw away the bad. So, <clears throat> okay, so let, let me bring now Anthony to give his, as we call it, two cents here. And then we'll go to some questions. Like I said, we're not going to go all night here as some are wont to do. And uh, we'll, we'll go to Anthony and then I see a lot of questions popping up and we'll try and, and answer some of those for you. Good evening, Anthony. Thank you for yeah. joining me. Thank you. That's an interesting introduction. I'm going to be a little bit awkward here because I actually don't see the point of the question. <laughs> so you'll have to help me with that. You made a good analogy there. You can't play chess without a chessboard. You don't decide on where the edges of the board are. That's taken for granted. I would simply put this to all of you listening tonight. It's assumed in the New Testament by all the writers that you know what scripture is. Now, I know that some of the books were canonized later. I understand that. But it's like saying, well, I'm not sure if I believe in God. So I think the question is not a valid one. Jesus is a scripture person. Jesus, I remind you, says in the Gospel of John that we're going to be judged by his words. Well, now imagine if we don't know where his words are, if we think that some of his words in one or two of the Gospels aren't genuine. That's a very cruel thing. That's a very heartless God who would say, I'm going to judge you by the words of scripture and yet you can't tell where scripture is. I find that quite impossible. So at the common sense level, I'll have to register my protests against this question. It's like saying, does God exist? I don't think we have that option. The existence of God is not an option. It's not something to question. Okay, a few texts in the New Testament. You'll find that Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus constantly says, it is written. It stands written. For Jesus, the canon of scripture is not something to argue about. And so now we are 2,000 years ahead of where Jesus and the apostles were. I think all of those books were written by apostles, with the exception of Luke, who did write an awful lot of the New Testament. But I don't see the point of saying, what is scripture? Because to do so is really to question the existence of the faith. How can Peter say, that some people who are not learned twist 
the words of Paul, he said. They twist the words of Paul as they do the other scriptures. That statement from Peter is completely meaningless for me if I don't know what scripture is. It has no value for me at all. It's completely out of the question that anybody in biblical times questioned the canon. Now, it might have taken them a while to get it all together. I see that for various reasons. But what I've got now, if that's not the text of Scripture, why not abandon the faith altogether? Because you can't know. So if someone is going to say, I don't like this or that book, let them explain what it is they don't like, and we will attempt to explain to them it's okay. It doesn't disagree with something else. Let's take a classic case. Some people say that John said the Last Supper was on a different day from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think that's completely false. Endless work has been done, and you should consult all those books who try to, I think, rightly harmonize the text of Scripture. That's a classic case, the date of the Lord's Supper. And you can go to the appendix in Robertson's Harmony of the New Testament. He does a splendid job. There's no contradiction at all. None. Absolutely none. So if someone is going to raise this, I think, frightening question, <laughs> do we have the canon of Scripture? Let him say what it is he doesn't like. Now, we do know that Luther was guilty of terrible, um, uh, assuming one book better than another. Luther's the one who said, John's gospel is the only gospel that is really valid. The rest are okay, but John is the only spiritual gospel. How dare he say that? So Luther has a canon within the canon. That is a fearful arrogance from my point of view. You can't do that. Who said that Luther has the authority to say that John is better than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Why do you think we've got four Gospels? Well, because they're the ones that tell about the teachings of Jesus. And if there's one thing the New Testament says absolutely to a man across the board, it says you mustn't forget what Jesus said. And that's exactly what we, I say we broadly as Christians, as in the West, the tendency is a fearfully dangerous one. The tendency is to say, well, I believe in what Jesus did. He died and rose. And the whole point, I mean, the whole point of Scripture is that you've got to pay attention to what Jesus said. The words that I speak to you, Jesus said, are spirit and life, John 6, 63. You are going to be judged. You listening tonight are going to be judged by the words of Jesus. And if we're going to say, well, I don't know what those words are because I don't know if this or that book is canonical, I think the whole venture is lost. You might as well say, I'm not sure if God exists. You've really abandoned the faith. You've really said, I don't know what Christianity is because I can't be sure about the canon. I'm sorry to be single-minded on this point, but I want an answer to that. If somebody can explain that to me, I'll be very happy to understand. But for the moment, you might as well be an atheist. You might as well play chess on a board with no limits on it. The whole point, I mean the whole major point of Scripture, is not whether, well, John was accurate in some geographical point and somebody else wasn't. That's absolutely not the main point. The main point is that you cannot be judged as Jesus said, we're going to be judged by his words if we don't know what those words are. That would be an extraordinary attack, slap in the face to God, I would say, if we question the apostolicity and the genuineness of the canon. Jesus is our model. Jesus didn't talk about this or that book being right or wrong. He assumes the canon. We have to do the same thing today. Otherwise, I think we've really abandon the faith and we're creating all sorts of disagreements among ourselves because in the unitarian faith you'll find people are going to disagree entirely on this some will say well i think this book is okay and others will say no you're just going to divide and confuse and miss i think the real point is are we going to do and believe what scripture says all scripture i know that means writings and i'm not advocating a theory that every word had to be inspired in a sort of dictation manner. That's not the point. God used the characteristics and experiences of all the different writers 
But nevertheless, he ensured that scripture was provided for us, and it has been. And without that, there can be no faith at all. So I think we have to be very careful with this question, because we might, in fact, just be creating confusion and division and disagreement and endless argumentation that would get us, I think, not forward at all. That's what I've got to say. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Let, let me uh, go back to the inspiration of scripture. Yeah. Can, can you further define what that means for you? So if I were to ask you, what do you mean by inspiration of scripture? Can you well, further unpack yeah. that for yourself? Oh, absolutely. Inspiration, the, the Greek word there is theopneftos. It means God breathed. The words of scripture are God breathed words. They have the authority of God behind them. And God used apostles mostly, not Luke, I agree, he's an exception. But apostles are very special people. They have the signs of an apostle. The apostles had seen the risen Jesus. They're very, very special people. And so inspiration simply means that God's mind was working in their minds as they wrote scripture. Not everything they wrote was scripture, but God had to provide scripture just as he has to provide evidence of his own existence, and he does in abundance as we look around at, the, at the creation. God has bound himself to provide scripture for us. Otherwise, there's no basis for Christianity at all. If we don't know what scripture is, I think that's a very discouraging and potentially divisive idea. Right, so, one, so once again, to put a capper on this, mm. Uh, there is a section of Christianity, um, I guess you, they're still called fundamentalists, mm. uh, Christians who believe, similar to the Islamic faith, that God mm. sort of dictated. No, it's almost like that. a dictation from the Bible. No. Who said? Yes, we, yeah, <laughs> just to be clear, we, yeah. here in Restoration Fellowship, yes. Uh, we do not believe that, as Anthony was saying. Yeah. Uh, the uh, I'll give an an example, Anthony. We we often make yeah. when this topic comes up. Um, I think there are around. I forgot the number. It's it's about ten pagan authors are cited throughout mm. the Bible, all mm. the New Testament. I think it's around ten, maybe okay. less. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Paul would cite. Some some pagan author to make a point. Yes, of course. <clears throat> so we're not saying that then you should go back and and get the source of that pagan quote and canonize that of course not. pagan book. No. Similarly, um, the the biblical writers sometimes use uh, um, quotes yes. that are not in our known canon, like yes. for example, the Book of Enoch. Yes. They might use a, a quote from the the Bible that we is yep. not in our Bible. Yep. Again, the question we get is also: oh, Are you saying that Enoch, the first book, at least should be canon or no, part no, of the of canon? So. No, no. It's just uh, that. So that's the way we understand the yes. inspiration of Scripture. Yes. First, it's not dictation. No. We're not Muslims. <laughs> No. And and secondly, not every single word and letter is no, you know, is supposed dictated. To be, no, of course not. Right. No. Uh, here's a a, a follow-up question. Yes. I think you you yes. touched on it. Yes. Do you believe in the inerrancy of scripture? I believe in the authority of scripture. I'll put it that way. If by inerrancy you're talking about dictation, no, I don't need that at all. I do believe in the authority of scripture because Jesus did. Jesus is our model, and he works out of an accepted canon of the Old Testament. Now, if Paul occasionally were to quote a pagan poet, then those words of that poet become, as we say, inscripturated. They become part of scripture. Doesn't mean that Paul approved of everything that poet said. Of course not. This really isn't difficult. Your analogy of playing chess is excellent. And that's why I'm nervous about raising this question, because I think it will lead to all sorts of argumentation and division. And I remind you that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, I want above all you believers to say the same thing, to be perfectly united. And raising this sort of question seems to me to lead us in the direction of all sorts of disagreements 
and disuniting. So I'm I'm not understanding the question. Is really what I'm saying. Uh, one more, Anthony. Hmm. Do you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? I believe in the authority of Scripture. <laughs> I mean, these are uh, clever terms. I mean, sufficiency is, of course, it is. God has given us what we need for Him to judge us by those words. Now, if He's going to threaten to judge us, not threaten, but Jesus said that we're going to be judged by the words of Scripture. Oh, but I'm not going to tell you what those are. That is extraordinarily cruel. It's rather like the doctrine of eternal punishment. It's a slap in the face of Jesus, a slap in the face of God, if we're going to doubt the authenticity, the authority, the sufficiency of Scripture, but not by dictation, of course. That's going to a mad extreme, I think, on the other side. No need for that. So the authority of Scripture, yes, only, as I say, Jesus did. You don't find Jesus saying, well, I'm not sure if this book is canonical or not. That's not even a permissible question. Yeah, I would say for my part that yep. um, uh, this comes to bear when we're dealing with Trinitarians. Yes. Uh, because Trinitarians follow their creeds, mm -hmm. their Catholic creeds from Nicaea, Chalcedon. Yes. So Absolutely. 300, 400 years, which tells me that the canon, the, the Bible is not sufficient. Of course. We, we need it for the councils to explain yes. uh, not just trivial things, but who God himself is, who his son himself is. So in a way, yes. um, I, I do accuse them of, of not holding to this Protestant tradition, if course. you want to call it, of yes. sufficiency of scripture, because yes. then scripture is not sufficient for me to explain to especially an unbeliever. Right. How many God is? I mm. need counsels mm. from hundreds of years later. Uh, yeah. Here's another question. I think we've <laughs> sort of touched on this, but yes. in your understanding, then who defines the Bible canon? Well, certainly not you and certainly not me. It's been done for us. My point is a very simple one. If you haven't got scripture, you have got no faith. There's nothing to have faith in. So you accept the scriptures as they are. And God was the one who was watching that because he himself says that you are going to be responsible for the standard of scripture. That's not my business to question what that canon is because it's going to lead to all sorts of disagreements. It was defined for us. Yes, God allowed it to take a little time and so on, but it's all been done. It's not, I think, a permissible question any more than it is to say, well, does God really exist? It's a non-question and it's not going to be productive. And I would recommend that people get on with their lives and obey the Bible. And that might be much easier. That's my suggestion. The problem is to get people to do and believe what's in the scripture. That's the issue. For example, I read today in the Word Biblical Commentary, I was shocked. They're talking about the Shema in the Word Biblical Commentary on Mark. And the writer of that learned piece says, you know, Jesus reciting the Shema is not remarkable and not specifically Christian. Do you hear that? What Jesus said is not Christian. That's the greater problem that we should be tackling. It's mass chaos and people don't realize that professors with degrees don't actually think that what Jesus said is important. Take it or leave it. That's the problem we need to be confronting. Yeah, I would say to mm. the question who defines yes. the Bible canon, mm. I would say if you're coming, mm. I came to Christianity relatively old, older mm. in my life. I was 32. Yes. So I think these are legitimate questions if you're coming from an unbelieving agnostic yes. as i was point of view like mm -hmm. okay anthony tell mm. me about this religion of yours mm. all right wh why do you think this you know is has should have any authority why should i be made to care as some say um so i'll i'll, t I'll answer yeah. the question yeah. with that Please, in yeah. that spirit and Please, i'll yeah. i think this quote helped me anyway mm -hmm. Where, where Metzger here says in yes. the book, The Canning of the New Testament, that there was a high degree of acceptance mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. within Christianity. Yep. 
this is very important because there's this, as you know, Anthony, Da Vinci Code, mm. as I call it, Christianity, mm -hmm. where a lot of Christians has been misled to think that the Emperor Constantine or the bishops at that mm. time, especially if you're non-Trinitarian, if you're not, quote, Orthodox, mm -hmm. Protestant, mm -hmm. Catholic, you know, a lot of people have been sucked into this notion that, oh, this canon was put together by people I don't even agree with. Yep. Well, no, they were put together way before Constantine. Oh, yes. In the first two centuries, first decades, I would argue, and by Christians. So, and, and it was throughout the known world at the time. It wasn't just like a localized place, right. but throughout, as it says. And now we know this because this is historically uh, based. We know this because Christians were everywhere at that time. We know this from mm -hmm. archaeological evidence, textual mm -hmm. evidence, mm. And, and so forth. So I hope that that helps you as it yeah. has helped. Let me add this, Carlos, if I may. The book of Revelation, Luther at the beginning said, I don't think that's a Christian book at all. Now, later on, he was a little bit more sympathetic to it. But he said, I don't think it's a Christian book. Christ is not taught in the book of Revelation. And then Luther said, I don't like those threats at the end of the book of Revelation. At the end of the book of Revelation, it says, if you take away from what's written here, or if you add stuff that's not there, woe betide you you're really in bad trouble you're going to be punished severely by god you can't use that kind of language unless there's an accepted canon so my point is a very simple one the canon of scripture is assumed by all the writers of the new testament now it's assumed it's not something to question any more than you question the existence i think of god uh, another question here mm. anthony yeah uh, why not have the uh, so-called apocryphal books in our current book? So yeah. just to explain to people, the Catholic Bible mm. is is different from the so-called Protestant Bible in that they have extra books like the book of yep. the Maccabeans uh, and, and some other prophets, I think. Um, yeah. What do you think about Well, that? I think that quite clearly there are doctrines in those apocryphal books which are contrary which are contradictory to scripture. One would, the, would be the immortality of the soul. It's very easy to see that in those books, which are not part of our canon, they would be contradicting the Bible. You don't want a canon that's going to be self-contradictory. That would show that it's not valid. So it's not very difficult to see that those are heavily influenced by Greek philosophy, the one thing that Paul warned against and Jesus warned against. So that's, I think, a very clear answer. You can read them. There's good stuff in there. There are very reasonable uh, truths in there too, but they're mixed with some very erroneous doctrines. And that's why they never made it into the canon, I think. Uh, yes, it goes back, I think, to the, uh, the process of canonicity. Yeah. Um, it goes back to this. Is it apostolic? Is it orthodox yeah. uh, and cath Catholic in terms of universality, mm. by the yeah. way, not yeah. not Catholic as in Catholic Church. No, no, not Roman Catholic, no. Um, and this question, uh, why isn't historicity a criteria for canonical status? It is. It is. This is all, if you, mm. if you look at, at this process, it's all about history. Yes. I mean, was a book written by an apostle or, or an associate of an apostle? That had to be agreed upon early. Mm -hmm. That's history. Yes. Did it conform to the teachings of the early Christians? That's history. Mm -hmm. So it's all based on a historical method. Yes. Along with obviously a a uh, eyewitness account method mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the time. So mm -hmm. that's how I would argue that. Yeah. Um, here's a question, Anthony. Why is this an issue? For those professing to be Christian, wouldn't we be arguing this with non-believers? <laughs> yes, I think that's right. It's not a permissible argument among ourselves. Uh, if we are going to persuade non-Christian to become Christians, they may have some fair questions about this. But I would invite them on this point. The Bible says that the world is going to get it wrong. The Bible says, Jesus says, multitudes of people are going to say 
in that future day, Lord, Lord, look what we did. Look, we were Christians. We preached in your name. We did miracles in your name. Get out of here. How did the Bible know? How did Jesus know that that's true? It is self-evident to me that the gospel of the kingdom, which is the central message of Jesus, is not currently being preached in evangelicalism. How did Jesus know, apart from inspiration, and I think he was full of the Spirit, how did he know that that should be recorded? That is just brilliant. So the Bible is very smart. It was able to foresee what was coming. And that's why Paul said, be very careful. I'm warning you, if somebody comes and doesn't bring the teaching of Jesus, 1 Timothy 6, 3, watch out, you're being scanned. That's extremely smart and it's part of scripture. God is the one providing scripture. That's not my business. He's the one who's going to judge us by scripture. So I think we must be very careful not to ask questions that really don't advance the cause in any way. Yes, um, once again, mm. we're only doing this because, uh, well, one person at least, mm. Josiah from mm. Integrity Syndicate mm -hmm. has brought this to light in our Christian, little yes. Christian non trinitarian sure. community. Yeah. As far as I know, no one else has issues. Well, no. We've never delved into this. But Anthony is right mm. uh, to answer the question that we nonetheless must have this information available yeah. to us because as we know we have to give an accounting as scripture says yes we have to give an answer to an unbelieving world of our faith yes so there are legitimate questions that should be addressed to the non-believing yes. so-called non-christian world and that's how we win people obviously we want to widen the salvation net um but yeah these matters tonight are being discussed yes. mainly because some in our small mm -hmm. christian mm -hmm. family let's call it mm -hmm. have brought this to light and we're just trying to give a a uh, loving uh, yes. rebuttal or answer yes. if you will <laughs> and That's in right. it, always speaking <laughs> the truth in love of course we should do that yes and we should also <clears throat> note that jesus was the biggest fundamentalist ever <laughs> so if you're interested in following jesus which presumably you are you better be following him. And he keeps saying it's written. God said, God decreed this. He doesn't question scripture. It's taken for granted and assumed that God exists. And Jesus takes for granted and doesn't question in any way the validity of scripture. In his case, of course, that was the old covenant scriptures at that time. If God allowed the old covenant scriptures, Moses, the law of Moses to be scripture, do we really think that when he comes to the new covenant, God sort of went slack and forgot to do anything? That's just absurd. You have logically to have scripture for the for there to be any faith, I would say. Yeah, it's it's difficult with the world, with the unbelieving world, mm. because I always say when we talk about these issues, Anthony, that if for an unbeliever, it's it's damned if you do. And yeah. damned if you don't. <laughs> yeah. In other words, if we had a, a New Testament that was like copied, yes. every book was a copy of, of, of the yes. other book. Yes. Then we obviously the the shout would be, oh, it's yes. all copied. Yes. But you know, <laughs> when it comes to the gospels, to the life and ministry of yes. Jesus. It's interesting to me because once again, and you can only learn this if you do a little bit of history in your own uh, mm -hmm. time, or mm -hmm. you go to a, an education yes. service, uh, a college, uh, whatever, yeah. and you do history 101, ancient history. Mm. But the way history works is that when it comes to a biography of an individual, yes. you're not going to get carbon copies, no. biographies. No. Each writer has his own um, angle. Each writer has unique things to say about the individual in question. You know, I was given this example, Anthony. Let's say a modern day famous person. Let's say Napoleon mm -hmm. Bonaparte. If you pick up four biographies of Napoleon, you're going to get not only different information and unique information that one historian or author did not have, right? But that doesn't mean that 
what Napoleon did say or whatever is somehow being fabricated by the author no. or the historian no. who wrote no. whatever copy. No. If anything, I would argue, and many argue this, mm -hmm. if anything, the Jesus we get in these four different views, especially John, who is the most, let's say, different, that actually elevates the historicity, yeah. or as the scholars call it, the historical Jesus. Yeah, That actually elevates him to someone who was actually real, who Absolutely. said what he said, did what he did, and, and so on. So, Yeah, or you're making my point. You can't have Christianity without a canon. Forget it. There is no Christianity if you don't have a canon. There is no chess to play if there's no chessboard. That's a good analogy. That's not our business to make that up. We don't determine the size of the chessboard. That's assumed. The New Testament writers, including particularly Jesus himself, assumes the validity of the canon, without which there's no Christianity to talk about. Okay. Uh, yep, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see. I was trying to get in mm. more questions mm. here, but let me go to a comment here on yes. a net Bible comment. So we've been talking about yes. the scripture mm -hmm. in, uh, let me see, before uh, you leave us, Anthony. Mm. So here we have, this is the net Bible. Usually yes. we... Uh, speaking of these things in all his letters, yes. some things in these letters are hard to understand. Yes. Things the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they also do to the rest of the scriptures. Yes. So what I want to read here is their comment yes, good. on the word scriptures. Good. I think it's 58. Like that could be very good. 58. This like one that. incidental line. Yes. Uh, let me see. The rest of the scriptures yes. links Paul's writings with scripture. Yes. This is thus one of the earliest affirmations of any part of the New Testament as yes. scripture. Yes. Peter's words were prophetic mm -hmm. and were intended as a preemptive strike <laughs> yes, against the heretics to come. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a very good statement. Links is a little weak there. This one incidental line, the rest of the scriptures, doesn't just link Paul's writings with scripture. It states that Paul's writings are scripture. And there's a tendency for people to be foggy and vague in a lot of stuff they write, but the general idea is a good one from that Bible there. All right, Anthony. Well, thank you for your time oh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for um, doing it. Hope here's it's a useful. comment. Uh, Sir Anthony is unbudged. On this issue, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word. Well, I'm I'm open to a an argument that refutes what I'm saying. I'm learning by making statements and questioning people. I want somebody to explain to me how you can have the Christian faith without Scripture, and I'm listening carefully for your answers. Okay. All right, Anthony. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, and um, thanks everyone watching right now live. Uh, one last thing before we go, I forgot to um, I forgot to recommend some reading, some homework for you. So yes, these are the I guess classic texts uh, regarding this issue. Yes, again, they're Trinitarian. It doesn't mean we agree on everything and anything, but I think when it comes to this technical issue, let's call it a very technical issue that is more for the, again, unbelieving world and us fellow Christians, because most of us, if not all of us, accept the so-called canon as it is. But I would recommend this book. So this is the affirmation, Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman, text of the New Testament. Again, this is good information to evangelize, if you will, uh, when, when someone asks, uh, what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? I mean, that's a fair question in my book. Um, here's another one from Wallace. I quoted Daniel Wallace, revisiting the corruption of the New Testament, manuscript, patris patristic, apocryphal evidence. These uh, are very good books. And also, uh, 
specific to the Gospel of John, which was one of the conversations, is this article I found. I'll put it in the chat. I thought it was very good. It addresses many of the questions regarding the Gospel of John. <clears throat> this is uh, Dr. Wallace, by the way, on the right there. He's the premier uh, so-called textual critic. By the way, a textual critic simply means someone who studies the various manuscripts, fragments. Remember, all we have are copies of copies of copies. So there's no original Gospel of John, Gospel of Mark. So these people devote their lives basically to counting. They're good counters. <laughs> so, uh, and I thought this this was a, a rather extensive uh, article here. You can look at it, uh, copiously uh, footnoted. And he gives uh, various uh, answers and arguments for the uh, Gospel of John, which is really the one of the big arguments out there in the liberal world and unbelieving world. All right, everyone, thanks again for joining us. And uh, join us this weekend. We will continue with the Gospel of John, uh, uh, chapter 15, I believe we're at. So until we meet again, God bless and be safe.